I think another another term for part 13 is just be cool. Be cool. Just be cool. Like don't don't right. make this crazy. Chill out. Chill out. Hang loose. Hang loose. All right. Hey everybody, Scott here with another Act for Dummies. In today's installment of Act for Dummies, we answer some questions from our YouTube comments section. And we take a deep dive into FAR Part 13. We talk about uh, simplified acquisition procedures. And so the original question that we had was about comparative evaluations using uh, simplified acquisition procedures. We have a video coming out for that, so we didn't go into real depth on that, but mostly what we talked about was how to use part 13 while borrowing principles from other parts of the FAR, but also still keeping, walking that fine line between using part 13 and just using the principles or, or, or completely going into a different part of the FAR. We hope you love this in-depth conversation. We love that the community is starting to ask questions. If you have any questions, that you would like us to answer, please leave it in the comments and we will get to it as soon as we can. Thanks. First, we're gonna start with one of our favorite people, Jared January. Yeah, can we take a moment to just talk about, talk about Jared? Jared is amazing. Jared comments on every one of our videos. He does. So Jared, if you're listening, we're answering this question for you, but you should, you should meet us at the next conference. We'd love to meet you. Yeah, absolutely. All I know about you is that little picture on your you have a nice mustache you do have a nice it's a mustache. good mustache yeah very nice. <laughs> we're big fans of mustaches so yeah. so jared says uh first he says great video and then he asks the question how does the contractor view mods modifications on fpds and do they access do they get access similar to government personnel okay what is fpd fpds ng yeah, NG. so okay. it's, um, man, I'm probably going to get this wrong. Federal Procurement Data System, and then, it, and then it's dash NG, which means next generation. Next generation. <laughs> yeah, next, gen it's pro next generation probably means like from the 1980s. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but FPDS NG is, so when, when the government has to create, uh, when the government creates contracts, mm -hmm they need to report it to Congress, like the dollar value, and um, they, they do it in a, something called a contract action report or a CAR. And um, so every contract action has an associated FPDSNG. Even OTs, other transactions, you're reporting on FPDSNG. So okay. multi-purposes here. One is it gathers information on contracts for reporting for, like I mentioned, Congress. The other is this is information that's publicly available to companies as well. So I could just look it up. You could look it up. Okay. Yeah. All right. So so Jared's talking about we in our last video we talked about when you when how do you know when you can how do you know when you pro, when you need to protest a modification? Yeah. So you lose a modification on a contract. Mm -hmm. And then um, you're thinking maybe there'll be I'm sorry, you lose a contract. And then you're thinking that that there may be going to be a modification that you want to protest because this is way too low and mm -hmm. you're maybe you're going to keep an eye on it. So uh, I think Jared, uh, uh, we're gonna. There's someone else on our team, uh, Mike, who's a lot more experienced in searching FPDS and G. What's Mike's favorite? What's his best character? Mike's best Mitch character, Mitch Gibson. I think Mitch Gibson. Mitch Gibson. Yeah. Okay. I like his Godfather. Though. Yeah, he's good on that too. He does. He does okay. get that first scene, especially. Uh, so Mike, we'll do a screenshot. But I believe you you can search by the contract in FPDS and G. And when you do, uh, it'll show all of the associated mods. And mods are, it's like the contract number, and then it's P0000, whatever, one. That's mod one. So if you search uh, under that contract, it'll, it'll show up all the mods. Okay. It's, it's probably, it, it gets very limited information uh, on what the mod is for. But if you look for, if, if you have some suspicion that this contract is going to be modified beyond the scope, um, then one of the best ways is to look for those mods that have a extremely high dollar value. And then there is some kind of explanation, like it was a supplemental agreement, which means both parties had to sign, which means you're not doing a kind of uh, 
if it's an administrative change to the contract, that can be a unilateral signature. Like if the government just signs like, hey, we're doing this, just FYI. You know? Okay. Uh, if, if it's any sort of bigger change, um, it's, it needs to be done through a supplemental agreement which means a supplemental agreement means that both parties have to sign. Look for those supplemental agreements, I think. High dollar value supplemental agreements. That could give you uh, an idea that the government is maybe moving into a situation where they're making that low baller well. And then you can potentially contact the office then. Uh, you maybe have to follow the FOIA Freedom of Information Act. But you can request for that modification from that office or so. Uh, also, the modifications, I believe, are posted on SAM. So once you find out on, on uh, FPDSNG what mod that is, you should be able to go over to SAM and pull that mod and maybe get more information on what that mod was about, maybe, if they posted it on, on SAM. That's the best answer I got for you, Jared, but yeah. uh, we'll try to put some screenshots to show you that what that looks like. Totally. It, bottom line, though, you got to do a little bit more digging if you want to protest the mod, because you're you're not engaged in a competition anymore. You're not going to be notified of an award. Mods are sometimes, they're not supposed to, but kind of done under the carpet a little bit. So you have to be a prudent contractor to really keep track of something that you think is going to be a cardinal change that should be protested. But you should, because the government should not do cardinal changes. They need to be held accountable. So, so start digging. All right. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Thanks for Jared. the question. Yeah. All right. And then we have, uh, looks like Andre Gatlin. Andre Gatlin. asked a question on the same video. Um, he said, how should the government utilize comparison evaluation to compare quotes among each other to get the best value for SAP actions? Okay. SAP. What's SAP? SAP is Simplified Acquisition Procedures. Okay. I know that. Which is from part? 13. There you go. You're great. You're better graduating. than part 15 if you can do it. That's right, man. All right. Man, look at this. Makes you flow better. So I think uh, Andre is referring to, in our last video we did, Act for Dummies, we talked a lot about evaluation procedures for part 15. We mentioned part 14, which is sealed bidding. Mentioned part 15. And we actually, we, we just recently did a the Gold Rush videos we did. Uh, yeah, those on, are coming out. Coming out on fair and reasonable price. And we go through the different steps of a price analysis. Another preferred approach to price analysis is just to compare your price with other offers. That there is called adequate price competition. Competition? The gold is scarce in these parts. We are following some part 15 principles from that, but they're also listed in part 13. So simplified acquisition procedures are, um, are different than part 15. And they're different than part 14. I'm glad, Andre, you asked this question because we really kind of focused on part 15 mm -hmm. and the reality in today, especially with, uh, we could talk about some thresholds that have been bumped up. So, so uh, the simplified acquisition procedures, you use those procedures when your requirement, the, the value of your requirement is anticipated to fall below the SAT, which we talked about the SAT before. Simplified acquisition threshold. That's right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and it's currently 250000 Okay. That's pretty low. However, for commercial items, there's a commercial items exception uh, on uh, FAR subpart 13.5 okay. that takes the SAP threshold up to, I think it's $7.5 million um, for commercial. What's, what's a commercial product? Commercial product is um, anything that's of well. Actually, let's just look at commercial item. Let's do far it. part two. Why? Why would I answer when I have our trusty 2011 far with us? We even I, got it its own little seat. We got it a pillow video. this time. Yeah, <laughs> because I'm going to look at it real quick. Commercial item. I think they've changed the terminology on commercial item. But anyway, we'll use this. Commercial item means any item other than real property that is of a type customarily used by the general public or by non-governmental entities for purposes other than governmental purposes. So basically, any item available in the marketplace that is not tailored specifically for governmental use. Okay, so it's uh, something that kind of just already exists out in the wild. Already exists. And you want it. Yeah. Okay. And there's, there's a subset called commercial off-the-shelf item. Cots is available, Cots. commercially off-available. 
uh, commercially off the shelf. Off the shelf. Okay. Yeah. Um, but a commercial item uh, doesn't have to be a COTS item, but it is something that's used in, in the marketplace. The government has had a tendency to uh, put government specs on everything. We did a video a while back where we talked mm -hmm. about like $400 hammers. Yeah. And $1,000 toilet seats or, you know, that's, that's an example of the government over specifying for specific government use. And uh, the government has since really um, strayed from that. There's something called the Federal Acquisition Streamlining Act, okay. which I think was in 1992. We can do another fact check. Okay. I don't know. I, you know, it was during Clinton, Clinton years, I remember okay. that. And that was really for the purpose of just making things faster. Just use what's already commercially available. Stop mill specking everything or for non-DOD, stop government specking everything. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, okay. So that is... Um, that is a commercial item. And if you use commercial items, then you can use simplified acquisition procedures for any requirement under 7.5 million. There's a big delta between 250,000 and 7.5 million. So for that reason, I would say that in most federal government offices, you should be able to use part 13. Part 15 is becoming more and more probably of a rare occurrence. And even when you have really high dollar amounts, you can get around part 15. So we mentioned this in a video. Part 15 is a part that you should, as much as possible, um, try to avoid if you can. But it's the part that you never wanna use. You never wanna use a part 15 procurement if you can help it. Because it's got a lot of underlying principles are embedded in part 15. Most of the protests, most of the discussions, like the late rule, the late proposal rule, uh, price analysis, price realism or cost realism, that's all within part 15. Part 15 is the most discussed and most litigated part of the FAR, but it's the part that you also don't want to be in. So you can, you can borrow concepts from part 15, but don't use part 15. Use part 13. Okay. And I'll, we'll explain why. I, I got yeah. a question. So COTS. Yeah. Is that just physical products can that be software or services yeah, absolutely or anything like that yeah services that's a well let's let's find out so okay. software yes software yeah. uh more traditional i guess software is technically a service software is a service but more traditional let's see commercial cots commercial off the shelf let's look at that um let's see commercially available off the shelf item means any item of supply this is a supply Okay. Uh, including construction materials that is a commercial item, okay. but it's a subset for commercial item and sold in substantial quantities in the commercial marketplace. Okay. Hence the word shelf. It's shelf. the proverbial shelf. Okay. It's got like a bulk supply. You're just, you're just pulling a couple from the shelf. Okay. Why would you make that more complicated than it needs to be if you're just pulling something available, from, available from the market off the shelf? Laptops, USB drives, although you... I guess USB drives are a problem in the government. Are they? You're not allowed to use USB drives on your government laptops. I would get emails when I was working in the government office that said, someone, uh, we, we've been in, in notified that someone has used a USB drive. If you do that again, you're getting your computer taken. It was very serious. No USBs. So bad example of a COTS item. Okay. So no USB drives. <laughs> no USBs. But any, like pencils, you know, like okay. uh, any sort of supply that the government needs, that's COTS. Don't do a whole thing. Like so it a, would be like a software if you buy it one, like a one-time software that you would buy? Yeah, one-time. Okay. What about like a subscription-based software? I think that's COTS, but it says, means I, this is where the FAR can get a little bit sloppy. Yeah. Uh, because technically, licenses and subscriptions are services. Because you're not okay. really owning that software. You yeah. are, the, 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 um, the contractor is serving you by giving you access okay you know like a lease is a service as well mm -hmm. because you're not actually owning anything tangibly you're you are engaging in a service contract with the contractor and legally speaking that contractor is engaging in the services of letting you borrow their thing okay <laughs> does that make sense kind of yeah yeah so a right. supply is like something you keep all right and software is kind of weird with that with licenses yeah. so all, all the software i use most of it's going to subscription based like yeah. photoshop photoshop yeah i used to you know buy it for three or four hundred dollars every few years when they updated and now it's just 30 bucks a month yeah so yeah and it's it's not something you own if they decide to update mm -hmm. 
especially if it's, it used to be where you could like, you know, in the, in the olden days, you could download Microsoft Office on a disc mm -hmm. and that version of Microsoft Office is kind of yours. Yeah. You know, like they're not, they can't update it or anything or they, they mm -hmm. couldn't. Now everything is so web-based, you know, yeah. that you really don't, like they can update it and you just have to deal with that update. Okay. So that's where it gets sloppy. This is kind of off subject, but uh, where it gets really sloppy, I had to deal with this, is when, when you deem software as a service, <laughs> uh, technically you're supposed to apply service contracting rules to that company. Okay. And I'll give you one example of, of where this gets really sloppy and not thought out. There's something called ECMRA. Okay. It's Electronic Contractor Manpower Reporting A. A. <laughs> a. Uh, okay. That was a, requ it's a requirement in, I know this is a requirement in DOD contracts. I don't know if it still is, but you're, it's a requirement you put in your contracts where the contractors have to report their man hours that they, that they worked on the contract. It's incredibly tedious. It's, I, I couldn't stand it. Uh, mm. I, I had to work with a lot of small contractors to help them put their hours in the system. And I had to put that in um, software contracts. These guys were just giving me a license for their stuff. Okay. And I was like, all right, well, uh, can, you put me, can you tell me how many hours that you spent on this contract this week? He was like, I don't know. How long was this phone call? <laughs> I was like, we just gave you the license. Yeah. So sometimes we could do like if there's customer service or something. It's like I can tell you how many hours my customer. It was super awkward. It, it shouldn't yeah. be. So software shouldn't be treated as a service. A little off topic, but it is COTS. Yeah. And and the whole point of of, of uh, talking about commercial items is uh, when you when you buy commercial items. This is why they raised the threshold up to seven point five million. When you buy commercial items, don't make it any harder than it needs to be. I think there's a fear in the contracting office community and the government that we just need to cross our T's and dot our I's and do everything perfect. There's a fear that the uh, that policy people and their supervisors who are gonna be reviewing their solicitation before it goes out are gonna put red marker on it. So their idea is let's just make this super thorough so that it gets out the door. Second fear is protests. They just want a really well-documented. And those two fears lead to incredibly unnecessary paperwork processes, uh, and it turns into a part 15. You can take part 13 and turn it into a part 15. Okay. Easy. It's done all, done all the time. Let's crack open part 13, though. Okay. And the FAR itself, even back in 2011, uh, talks about that you should do the opposite of that. The, the whole purpose of part 13 is to, um, to, uh, to, go, to, to, to make things incredibly easy. Okay. So, for example, like 13.002, the purpose, so the purpose of this part is to create these simplified acquisition procedures in order to, and then it lists these reasons. Sure. Reduce administrative costs. In other words, don't, don't, don't overdo it. Yeah, don't overdo it. Exactly. Yeah. Don't overdo it. Don't overthink it in a way. Yeah. Uh, improve opportunities for small, small disadvantaged, women-owned, veteran-owned, hub-zone businesses. So there's a couple nuances there mm -hmm. uh, in, with the small business. If you're under the simplified acquisition threshold, Part 13 tells you later you don't have to uh, take as much time looking for the certificate, the validity of their certification. Okay. Just move out, get that small business. Um, and then the, the rule of two works a little bit different with small business set-asides where you need That's at least two. Uh, so if, if there's at least two small businesses okay. that you know will do the job well, you need, to, you need to set it aside. Don't go large. Okay. We should do a video on the rule of two. Yeah. So, yeah. so uh, okay. Third reason. Promote efficiency and economy. Fourth reason, avoid unnecessary burdens for agencies and contractors. If we would just use part 13, if, if, actually, if, before you use part 13, <laughs> government, uh, just read that. Read 13.002 before any part 13. That's the, that is your vision. That's the North Star. That is like, you need to avoid unnecessary burdens, promote efficiency, everything you do. And what's really amazing about Part 13 is it provides so much flexibility, way more flexibility than I think most contracting officers uh, are comfortable taking because of office culture or whatever. But let's look at some of these. Uh, agencies shall use simplified acquisition procedures to the maximum extent practicable. Practicable, not practical. 
Tell me about practicable. You guys say that a lot. Practicable means uh, feasible. Okay. Yeah. So, pre- and I hear all the time people say maximum extent practical. Not the same thing. Practical is living like it's, it's common sense or whatever. Practicable means you're able to do it. If you're not able to do it, if it's not feasible, if it's going to be, if it's not going to like, you know, make any, you know, sense that you're taking this time to do it, don't do it. That, that it's not practicable. So, okay. shall you simplify acquisition to the maximum extent practicable? Um, let's see here. And it has, it has like exceptions for, you don't use it for a federal, like we talked about federal prison industries, required uh-huh. sources of supply. Okay. There's a video we did about that part eight. Mm-hmm. You're using part eight for that. Ability one. Ability one. You're not okay. using part 13. Even okay. if it's below the simplified acquisition threshold, you're you're using part, I think it's eight point seven, subpart 8.7 procedures. Okay. So there's, yeah. And by the way, I don't, not to confuse things more, but there's part 13 simplified acquisition. Part 14 is sealed bidding. Part 15 is contract by negotiation. There's other parts of the FAR that people use not those three to do source selections. And yeah, so, I mean, what's the most obscure one? uh, The most obscure one? Well, the one I've never used is part 36, which is um, construction and architecture. That's a whole nother realm of contracting. Uh, R&D is another research and development. So R&D, they have different types of solicitations you do. There's one example is a broad agency announcement, a BAA. so part, people think part 12 is one of those. Th- part 12 is for commercial items. Okay. But part 12, I don't classify as its own, you know, uh, contracting process because you use part 12 in conjunction with one of these. If it's a, if you're using a commercial item, uh, if you're buying a commercial item and it's under 7.5 million, you're using part 12 and part 13 together. Okay. It's the, yeah. So part 12 is like Synergy. a- Synergy. Synergy. Part 12 is like a little, we talked about this in the video, it's like a little seasoning. 12 is not like part 13. Uh, You use part 12 like a seasoning, like in conjunction with part 13 or in conjunction with part 15. Like if you're going commercial, you sprinkle some part 12 on your food and then it makes it even better. Part 12 is great. So you use part 12 and part 13 13 together, you got some magic happening. You got economy and efficiency if you do it the right way. Which sometimes it's not. So another here, here's another exception. Um, if you're ordering from a multiple award contract, like have you heard of IDIQ? I've heard it, but I don't know what it is. IDIQ is indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity contract. So so what you, the government can do is they can set up these massive. They, they don't have to be massive, but these ordering vehicles where you're just you're getting with the contractor and you're agreeing to. For an indefinite quantity, this is IDIQ, and an indefinite delivery time, just for the for this performance period. For, so from from now till maybe five years from now, we're, I, let's set up this order, this catalog. It's like a catalog. Okay. And then we're going to order from that catalog. Um, so we can have another discussion. I won't go into all the different types of ordering vehicles, but there's blanket purchase agreements. Which we, my first far we did. <laughs> Daddy. Yeah, champ? I'm cold. Can I have a blanket? Sure thing, buddy. But first, why don't you tell me what a blanket purchase agreement is? Blanket purchase agreements is another one, which is not a contract. So that's a, the agreements are not contracts. IDIQ is a contract. Okay. There's a discussion there about the nuances. So comment below if you want to hear about that. That's a great discussion. Okay. Um, federal supply schedules, FFFSS covered in part eight for GSA. And then I believe part um, 38 is, is talking about the federal supply schedules. So um, when you're ordering from a ordering vehicle, you're creating, if it's a service, you're creating a task order. I think if it's a supply, it's called a delivery order or something. I didn't do that much. It was mainly supplies. So task orders are huge in the government. In fact, I would say that there are many offices out there in the government that only the only procurement actions they do is a is a, war, a ordering from these ordering vehicles, okay. just doing task orders. That's it. They don't okay. they don't do the new contracts for Part Thirteen. They don't. So when they do that, it's 
uh, FAR subpart 16.5. There's a whole set of procedures on how to order um, from uh, ordering vehicles. Let, uh, we're gonna detour a little bit more on ordering vehicles. Okay. I'm sorry, Andre. I'm gonna give you a Bach answer. Let's do a Bach answer. Okay. A Bach answer is where we go on a different journey and talk about different stuff, and then we finally get back to that resolution note. All right, I'm excited. Do, you wanna go Bach? Let's go Bach. Let's go Bach on All right, ordering vehicles. Okay. So an indefinite, so, or, so ordering vehicles are discussed in part 16 of the FAR. We mentioned part 16 in, a, in the last video when we were talking about cost contract and fixed price contract. Mm -hmm. um, hold on, I wanna see if it's part 16. Because part 17, let me see. All right. Part 16 of the FAR talks about indefinite delivery contracts and something called agreements. Both of those, it's FAR subpart 16.5 and FAR subpart 16.7 are agreements. And those vehicles are ordering vehicles. So there's the IDIQ where you're saying, I don't know what the quantity is, I don't know when I'm gonna want them, indefinite delivery, I don't know when, definite quantity, don't know how many, but I know I want your apples. I'm gonna want your apples for the next five years, I just don't know, I don't know when people are gonna want apples, okay. when they're gonna get hungry. Um, I'm gonna be encouraged to not only get you and your company, but to get Mike's apples too, and Randy's apples. Okay. And so, I will get. I will create a contract with Mike, contract with Randy, contract with you, and I'll just create this multiple award contract. And then you guys all have contracts. So whenever I need apples, I'll go to you guys. And I won't engage, it's not called competition, like full and open competition, like part yeah. six. The term is called fair opportunity. That's the competitive procedures in an ordering vehicle. Okay. And so I am required to give you guys a fair opportunity to do a competition, uh, to, to compete for I can say, hey guys, I need, I need three apples. And they've got to go to my home in Jacksonville or whatever. Uh, you guys are going to give me your prices. That's supposed to be a very, very, very uh, quick and efficient process, though. You don't want to turn fair opportunity into like a drawn out six month ordeal. <laughs> so uh, there are requirements contracts, though, um, where a requirements contract also in sixteen point five is where I only go to you and you will be my exclusive Apple supplier for a certain amount of time. Okay. If I create an IDIQ, and even if it's just with you, um, I can walk away from that, just create another IDIQ. With a requirements contract, there's a little bit more commitment, and there's advantages of, and disadvantages, there's differences of requirements contracts versus IDIQ. Uh, IDIQ has a maximum threshold that if you, if you reach that, if I, if I say this is gonna be up to, it's gonna have a performance period up to it, but once we get to 200 apples, we're going beyond the scope of the IDIQ. We're okay. reaching the scope. Requirements, not really a maximum. You got like a range, but I can just buy as many apples as I need. So that's the advantage is I can buy as many as I need, but I have to go to you for that period. That's okay. a requirements versus IDIQ. Is the apple price set during that period? Apple prices are set. Okay. Yeah. There's, um, there can be exceptions to that. But typically, the prices need to be on the on the contract. Okay. Uh, an agreement is not a contract. An agreement is where two uh, the government gets together with a company like you. You know, I'll say, hey, I know I'm going to need apples. I think I'm going to need. You know, there's going to be a repetitive need for apples, but I'm not ready to do a contract yet. Let's go ahead and knock out the terms together and get it ready. So an agreement is basically an agreement to just get it ready. Uh, and once we get the, then, then I get, I give you a BPA, uh, for example, like a blanket purchase agreement or, um, and that BPA, by the way, is in part 13, cause that's the simplified version of a agreement in part 16. That what's the, what's the agreement in part 16? It's either called a BA, a basic agreement or a BOA, a basic ordering agreement. They call them BOAs. It's a pretty cool name. Yeah, I like it. Yeah. Uh, so a basic agreement between me and you, and there's, there's also nuances that are hard to, this has been a, like, what's the difference between a BA and a BOA? But basically, uh, we set the terms up in an agreement, not a contract. Uh, and then once the time comes to order from that agreement, we've got all the terms worked out. I just go to you and say, it's sometimes it's called a call, like a BPA call. I just order from that basic agreement. 
Okay. The reason why that we still don't have a contract. You don't like make a contract when you finally order. The order is the contract. The order. That's is the, the first contract. time okay. we actually engage in a contract. Okay. So that's why. So an IDIQ though is a contract, and so the difference between the two. There's a couple of differences. Why? And and sometimes I would purposely pick. Uh, I choose to do if it's if it's a part thirteen buy a BPA instead of something like an IDIQ because I had different flexibilities. Because it wasn't technically a contract action, I could bypass some of the reviews for contract. So if it's like a contract action shall be reviewed by boom, 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 boom. I didn't want to do all that. I just want to create an agreement with it. So, so you could do that. It's a lot simpler in a lot of ways. But what you're, um, what you're saving time up front in a, in a, like a basic agreement you're, you could create problems down the line. Could each one of those contracts you order from could have scrutiny from, uh, from people reviewing your contract. If you would award an IDIQ up front, it could take longer to get that IDIQ awarded because that's just a big ordering vehicle. Mm -hmm. But each task order should not be reviewed separately because the whole thing was already reviewed. So okay. that makes it so it's got kind of like you're investing. It's just how do you want to invest your time? Is there any, any world where you would do both so that you could get some of what you want faster? And, and then, then while and you're then later, and then while you're working out the ID IQ. Yeah. Like you're kind of doing the basic agreement and then when the ID IQ comes in. Yeah. I mean, so it would take, um, that's just a lot of work. It takes a lot of work to do okay. because it takes yeah. work to do like a BPA to set that up. Yeah. Still. Okay. So that would be probably be double work unless you set the BP up, BPA up with the contractor. And then maybe on um, some kind of, once the period of performance has ended, you say, let's turn this into a contract now because I'm sick of getting every single BPA order reviewed. Yeah. Okay. Um, the other distinction of a BPA and an IDIQ, there's some protest um, exceptions. So an IDIQ is, if you order from an IDIQ, uh, that's, you're, you're protected from protests up to... We'll have to fact check this up to 10 million i think oh wow if it's over 10 million you're gonna you can be protested if it's under 10 million if you're ordering from an idiq you shouldn't have a, a protest well we, we can double check that so the, but the initial like setup of the idiq could be protested but once that's oh, absolutely once and that's taken care of then you're kind of in the clear you have some protection okay because because that whole and it makes sense right because yeah. the whole thing was talked about discussed all the protests when you award the ID, IDIQ should have been all wrapped up in all the future orders. So the, so it's moot. Like if, if a company is going to protest an award of a task order, you know, uh, so uh, if you're doing, the only thing that you could really do is um, protest the fair opportunity. Like if, if I set a multiple award contract up with you, Randy and Mike, and I award to Randy, you could maybe want to protest me. Okay. But if it, I believe it's under 10 million, then okay. out of luck. So uh, the other difference, if it, it, since an, a BPA is not a contract, IDIQ is not a contract, when you award a BPA, you don't have to pay any money at all until you do that first order. You're just setting up a, some agreements. When you order an IDIQ, you have to set in an IDIQ the a minimum and a maximum that you're going to order from that IDIQ. And a minimum can't be a nominal. They call it a nominal amount, which okay. means you can't like say $1 I'll, yeah. and I just give you a dollar, like done. Uh, it's got to be something still uh, not nominal, you know, yeah. uh, and then you do the maximum. Because I'm setting a nominal fee when I give you an IDIQ, when I award that IDIQ, I need to satisfy that minimum oh, okay. immediately. Usually the rule, the local rule is you award the IDIQ same day, task order one's going out to at least meet that nominal fee. Okay. And the reason why uh, you want to do that is if you don't do that, it could lead to um, an unauthorized commitment of funds where you're, I'm promising I'm going to pay you a nominal fee and I don't have the funds to back it up. Okay. That's an unauthorized commitment. So anyway, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So that's the, di th so there's differences between even choosing your ordering vehicle uh, and it's the semantics of some ordering vehicles are not contracts okay. and some ordering uh, vehicles are, and there's advantages and disadvantages to both. The more you know about them, even the requirements contracts versus IDIQ, these are really great tools, but they're like screwdrivers. They're like flathead or Phillips head. You, the more you know about them, the more you'll be able to fit 
those vehicles in for a much better job at what you're doing. Yes. So uh, 16.505, FAR 16.505 is task order. I you think, seem excited about this part. Am I? Yeah. <laughs> like, I can't wait to get to yeah. part 16.505. It could be the Red Bull I just had. Okay, maybe. <laughs> No, I actually like this a lot because I was in an office where we did order from a lot of... So I'll, I'll give you an example of an IDIQ that uh, a lot of people use in the government. Um, Oasis is a GSA IDIQ. Okay. It's called a G-WAC. That's kind of a cool name, too. GWAC. Yeah, GWAC. I like GWAC with my chips. Gwa oh, yeah, GWAC. Yeah. Yeah, g whack a -mole. <laughs> <laughs> So a g whack a -mole is a government-wide acquisition contract okay. government-wide acquisition contract i think anyway um oasis is something the gsa offers general service administration they do a lot of big contracts that the whole government dod non-dod can order from um, another example is nasa has a big series of ordering vehicles called nasa soup well that's the duck one that's the duck that we saw in yeah, in the, yeah in that industry day yeah. <laughs> Yeah, soup. I don't know Maybe why. Maybe someone from NASA can tell us why they use ducks. We should talk to NASA about that. I asked a couple people and nobody knew. I just think it's so funny because everyone knows what soup is and everyone knows the duck. It's just so funny that comes from NASA. Yeah. You don't think of ducks with I, NASA. I don't. But, but it's, a, it's a very utilized vehicle. And actually, I used to love ordering from soup. It's, I did a lot of my IT okay. buys from that. Uh, they're, the reason why I loved ordering it, this goes to UX, um, it was super easy to use. I could set aside things. I was trying to, you know, I would try to do a service disabled veteran all, I just checked the box. You know, GSA has stuff easy to use as well. But anyway, you can set up your own IDIQ in, in your own contracting office. It can be a lot smaller, or you can just use a ginormous IDIQ like the ones, I, the soup is an IDIQ as well. Okay. So, yeah. Guax is a, a guac. Guacamole? Guacamole is an IDIQ. Uh, it, um, it doesn't have to be. Oh, okay. okay. But the, the ones that I'm thinking of always are. Okay, okay. So, but that is different than another huge kind of ordering vehicle. Okay, so, so far we've talked about IDIQs. We've talked about, uh, um, we've talked about IDIQs, we've talked about requirement contracts, uh, agreements. There's federal supply schedules as well. Okay. And that's under part eight. Uh, so, Part 8.4 talks about GSA. They set up these huge supply schedules. And you can order from those as well. You're not using Part 16.505 to order from those. You're not using Part 16.505 to compete. You're using 8.4. So depending on the vehicle that you use, you're going to a different part of the FAR. Okay. And a federal supply schedule is only set up by GSA. They're the only ones who do it. So when, when you hear people say like, you should go GSA on this or look at the GSA price schedule or look. It's not talking about Oasis. They, they, they do their own kind of IDIQs. It's really talking about these big federal supply schedules. Okay. They're ginormous. And as a company, like at ASI, we, we make sure we're on that schedule. As a company, it's good to be on that schedule because a lot of contracting offices will exclusively go to GSA. Okay, even, so the federal supply schedule, is that almost like a catalog that any government catalog. agency can order from? Any government agency. And huge the price catalog. is already vetted. Prices and the, are there. Published price lists are there. Okay. Very efficient contracting. I mean, it's they have something called SINs, I think. Okay. Supply item number. I always hated that acronym. Yeah. SIN. It's S-I-N. Yeah. <laughs> so everything is very formulaic. There's item numbers. It's very... Easy to, to set up a set aside for this particular sub, su, a supply item number and schedule 70. For the, there's different schedules, federal supply schedule. Schedule 70 is a really pop, that, that's IT. Okay. So if you can be a contractor in schedule 70, if you're part of that schedule, you're going to be part of any sort of notification of an RFQ. You okay. can submit RFQs. Um, or so you still have to do competition if you're using the yeah, federal supply schedule. Okay. You do. Okay. And we need it. We can double check this, but that may also be called fair opportunity on federal supply. I know it's fair opportunity with with IDIQs, like with Part 16 mm -hmm. vehicles. Okay. All right. So I I mentioned all that for the, this question. Are we getting? Are we going to bring it all box? A now? little bit. We're going to bring it. We're going to do a box. We're going to bring it close to the answer. Okay. And then go. 
right. <laughs> no, nah, we'll probably get to the answer now. I, I mentioned that because when, when Andre mentioned SAP mm-hmm. uh, and not part 15, there's actually a lot of simplified ways you can order things without using part 14 or part 15. Part Subpart 8.4, ordering from a federal supply schedule from GSA. That can be incredibly fast and simplified. Mm-hmm. Sub uh, FAR 16.505 or 16.5 and 16.7, uh, agreements and, um, and uh, indefinite delivery contracts can be very efficient, very simple, very fast, streamlined, efficiency way. Um, FAR uh, 13.3, I think, BPAs. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to remember that. That's what I, my son got it wrong in the commercial. I know. I didn't give him a blanket, and now I can't remember. (laughs) Why don't you tell me what a blanket purchase agreement is? It's a simplified method of filling repetitive needs for supplies or services by establishing a charge account with qualified sources of supply according to FAR subpart 13.6. Ooh, no, I'm sorry, son. It's FAR subpart 13.3. Tell you what, why don't you warm yourself with this tonight? Thanks, Daddy. FAR subpart 13.3.303. Blanket purchase agreements. Okay. So, sub uh, uh, FAR 13, FAR 8, FAR 16. Okay. All also very simplified ways. To order that are not part 13. So Wait, one of those was 13. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, ordering vehicle from BPAs. You're right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so I guess what I'm saying is ordering from ordering vehicles is a way to, to do okay. it. That's not necessarily, but, but even it, but they all fit the letter of the policy between, uh, behind part 13, you know, and just making sure, what is it again? Promote efficiency and economy, reduce administrative costs, Avoid unnecessary burdens. That is the main point of 13. So um, so let's get into some of these. Um, I'm just going to go through okay. efficiently to answer Andre's question. Let's just take a walk. Let's take a let's walk. Let's take a walk down part 13, Pat. All right. It'll be simple and efficient. Efficient. And it'll be dated to 2011. Because <laughs> that's the far that I have. Do you need a new far? I have one, but I just kind of, I like using, I like, I I get you know, what we could do is we could ask the viewers who want us to just fact check my, our 2011 and they can say, actually, yeah. the rules have changed on that. All right. So anyway, I'll, uh, I'll just fact check it. Yeah. <laughs> or we'll have Ann fact check it. Yeah. Ann can fact check. She's the master. She's, she's the master. We have, we have someone on our team who edits everything and uh, she's really good at it. Let's keep going here, though. Uh, so the Federal Acquisition Streamlining Act, oh, 1994. I said 92. You were so close. That was close. It was still Clinton. Yeah. So. Grunge was still big. Grunge was big. Lion King had come out. I think, wow. I think Lion King came out that year. That's some obscure knowledge there. It was, a, I, think, I think it was 94. It was a good year. We'll it, have to it, fact check Lion King. Yeah. <laughs> you had, 94 gave us <coughs> the Lion King and FASA. FASA. It's a pretty good year for yeah. America. <laughs> All right. Anyway, um, so let's go. Um, th- there's a whole bunch of stuff in here about applicable provisions. We won't go through all that, but it's basically those parts are saying, don't use this provision. Don't use this law. We're making things simple. And that, a lot of that has to do with FASA. FASA is okay. just, FASA is purging bureaucracy here. You know, it's saying yeah. if you're buying something simple, purge yourself. No administrative burden, you know, you know, so anyway. Okay. Part thir- subpart 13.1 is procedures. It's where things get fun. Okay. Um, so it talks a lot about uh, small business. Small business is a little bit changed. I'm just going to go through these, just uh, get to some of the big things here. But I do encourage contracting officers, companies, read part 13. It's not a difficult read. And it really talks about if If there's contracting officers, if you have not read part 13 yet, do so, and you'll find out exactly how much flexibility you have. It's unreal. And then you'll find out how so many offices aren't really following Part 13 to the letter of the law. They're turning it into a Part 15. By the way, the same goes for task orders as well. When you're so many contracting offices using 16.505 to order from task orders, they turn it. everyone wants to turn <laughs> everything into Part 15. Wow. It, and that's because Part 15 is such a 
it's packed full of underlying principles that everyone reads part 15 because we're getting like the, the concepts of past performance evaluations and LPTA. And so you're borrowing from so much of it, but you don't use it. Actually, there's something in here I want to mention uh, that says that. It says borrowing. Um, so it says, for example, uh, under um, 13.003, still the policy, the simplified acquisition threshold uh, for other than commercial items, uh, use any procedures in conjunction, combination of procedures from part 13, 14, 15. So, and it says the same thing for commercial items, part 12. Use this in, in combination with other procedures. Okay. Uh, the, the only danger of using, and the, I'm going to mention this because Andre mentioned this in the question is there's a real danger of using part 15 too much. So if you're using part 13, you're just doing what's practical. You know, you're using, doing to the maximum extent practicable. There's a lot of creativity. We'll talk about some, some policies in here that says you have a lot of discretion to be flexible. So that means you can borrow from principles of part 15 if you do it too much and it starts to look too much like a part 15 requirement uh, and, and the court, and, and it gets protested and the courts, um, Look at how you did things. Even though you said you did things simplified, if it looks like a de facto part 15, they will start judging you on part 15. Oh. And um, if they start judging you on part 15, you can be in trouble because you're going to say, well, if you use part 15, you did a lot of things wrong. You didn't set this out, the solicitation out for 30 days. You didn't do conduct this proper analysis. You didn't do the adjectival ratings like you should have done. Then they're going to they're gonna judge you by the, by the the old law <laughs> by the letter of the law so you you got to stay in part 13 because you have so many flexibilities that the courts will say if the courts look at it and say oh no you did part 13 they're gonna treat that with you know with the flexibility that, that it deserves like well no you had every right to do what you did okay. so that's that's a that, i mentioned that because that's a problem there's a lot of uh protest decisions i've read where the courts have said listen i know what you're saying you're saying you use part 13 everything you did looks like part 15 we're going to judge you on part 15. Okay. little warning there. All right. So um, let's see. Uh, I'm going to. Okay. So let's, let's look at 13.104. Uh, promoting competition. SECA does not apply. Uh, competition and Contracting Act. Part six doesn't okay. apply. You don't have to write. You don't have to write J and A's Ooh. for. You got to write something else. You still have to write like a limited sources justification or some, but it's technically not called a J and A. In in office parlance, contract. I'm sure every contracting office and every office will who uses Part 13 will say J and A if they're doing a sole source under the threshold. Technically, it's not a J and A because technically Part 16 or Part Six doesn't apply. Okay. Here's the rules. The contracting officer must promote competition to the maximum extent practicable. That's that term again. Um, that's it. Sorry. I mentioned that in the office, they do a lot of SAP. Um, this is why it's important to read part 13 to really understand what SAP procedures really are. And it's important to look at the words shall and must, which is a kind of a mandatory thing uh -huh. and, um, should, or, uh, should consider. Ooh. That's a recommendation from the FAR. Flexibility. It's an invitation to not do it. Not just <laughs> <laughs> so that's how my kids think of the word should. <laughs> yeah, should. Yeah. Oh, should. That means I don't yeah, have to. Okay. But seriously, I mean, if it doesn't make if it says should, then you apply it to the rules of practicable. Like, well, it doesn't make sense to do this, and since it doesn't say shall, do. Also, it talks about imperative sentences, like the word shall. That's imperative. But the word should is not imperative which means that sentences with should are not mandatory if it doesn't make sense or they're unnecessary. Hmm. It's kind of like the government's version of parental advice. The contracting officer must not, here's some of the requirements, solicit quotations based on personal preference. That's kind of what we were talking about, about the, those contractors who knew me by name yeah. and knew my kids. If I started being like, oh man, Scott Incorporated, I love the fact that Scott knows my kids. I'm just gonna ask him for a quote for apples. Uh, restrict solicitation to suppliers of well-known and widely distributed makes or brands. So if you start doing things for efficiency and economy in part 13, you can get into this habit. It's very easy to get into this habit where you have those two or three companies that you know, and bada bing, you just ask them, 
They're, you, they, they probably have the templates for you already lined up. Yeah. And you're like, I like Scott needs some apples. And you're like, okay, it's, it's discouraging. And part 13 says, don't do that. Like go fast, but don't cling to particular contractors. There's ordering vehicles for that. If you're going to do that, do it right and do a part 16 ordering vehicle with that company. Yeah. So don't turn part 13 into an ordering vehicle. Okay. All right. If using simplify, okay, let's see. Here's another thing. Uh, under B, I'm in uh, 13.104. Consider, here's the, consider, consider using solicitation of at least three sources to promote competition to the maximum extent practicable. That is a recommendation. Recommendation. And it is a rule in a lot of cultures and contracting offices. You got to get at least three sources. Yeah. People will even say that as a rule. It's like, well, did you get your three sources? That is a great practice. The FAR, when the FAR recommends it, it's a great practice. You should really consider it. Not required. So it actually says, whenever practicable, request quotations or offers from two sources not included from the previous solicitation. That's a great idea. Whenever practicable, another great yeah. suggestion. Don't have to do that. It, it says you shall not restrict solicitation to two or two or three. But it's saying a, a way to get a way to not you know break that rule is why don't you just try to bring two new people in each time? Okay. So you don't have to get three people. You, if you if you try to promote competition to the maximum extent practicable, and you're dealing with COTS items and commercial items you're most likely going to have competition and you can't just go with one company. You will, you will lose in a protest because the courts will say you clearly did not promote competition to the maximum extent practical. But that doesn't mean that you can just go out and ask for two people. Even if you know that a whole bunch of people can do it, you just need quotes from two. You can do that. You don't have to, you don't have to reach out to every single company that can do that thing. Okay. It's practicable. And some things you consider and practicable is under 13.106 when you solicit the competition, uh, the urgency of the proposed purchase. If it's urgent, you don't have to write this whole unusual and compelling urgency, like, oh, it's urgent, so we had to go with only those. You don't have to do any justification. It's urgent, just go with two. It doesn't matter that there's five that you know. You can, you can just reach out to that limited amount. And as I'm saying this, I know maybe ears are burning for, for those who are, because because this is, it's it's counterintuitive to maybe what the local policy is, but FAR, FAR 13 is in our, it's over and over again, slapping us in the face, telling us, reduce your burden. Don't make this harder than it has to be. It is giving contracting officers the flexibility to go fast. And we usually don't. We just, we're so worried that we're like, ah, we got to ask for offers from all these people. You don't. Um, okay. So... Okay, this goes to Andre's question. Evaluation. All right, so when evaluations come in, it's in 13.106-2 and 13.106-3. Those two sections in Part 13, probably the most important sections uh, for how you actually do this thing. Okay. Um, Dash two is evaluation of quotations or offers. Contracting officers shall evaluate quotations or offers in an impartial manner. Um, and then evaluation procedures. Here, here's this. The contracting officer has broad discretion in fashioning suitable evaluation procedures. It says here, right here, the procedures prescribed in parts 15 and 14 are not mandatory. You don't have to do best value continuum. We're talking about you don't have to do LPTA. <coughs> you don't have to do trade off. And then it says, at the contracting officer's discretion, one or more, but not necessarily all of the evaluation procedures in part, four, in part 15, for example, may be used. But again, with the caveat, you got to be careful with that, because if you go too much into part 15, you, you'll be de facto using yeah. part. Okay. So, yeah. May uh, be used. Maybe. Yeah, you can, so you can borrow. And, and what that really means is, in part 13, it's a great idea to do a version of a trade-off analysis. Okay. And what we did in, in, in a previous office, we didn't call it trade-off because we were so worried that our part 13 requirements would, would look too much like part 15. So we just used different terminology. Oh, uh, for, we didn't do LPTA. We didn't do trade-off. But we did, some, we did a version of that. Okay. So you can still do evaluation factors for trade-off. 
uh, for a trade-off type thing. You can still say, you know, uh, I, I want, uh, we're going to consider your technical uh, competence, your technical abilities, your past performance, and your price. Okay. If using price and other factors ensure they can be evaluated in a efficient and minimally burdensome manner, right. it's peppered throughout this part. Just be simple. I think another another term for part 13 is just be cool. Be cool. Just be cool. Like don't don't right. make this crazy. Chill yeah. out. Chill out. Hang loose. Hang loose. All right. Uh, conducting discussions and scoring quotations are not required. So anyway, um, so and then it goes into um, the fair and reasonable price. And it has the same type of price analysis techniques. The first thing is, before making an award, the contracting officer must determine that the proposed price is fair and reasonable. Okay. And we did the... Not too high, not too low. Not price can't be high and can't be too low. Whenever possible, base price reasonableness on competitive quotations. If you have competition, you're good to go. Okay. In our in our example, the gold dealer did not have adequate price competition. The gold that he was looking at was a special kind of gold. Special kind of gold. So you could not compare apples to apples. Um, so and then you have all these other techniques which we can go into. And if you just watch our fair and reasonable price for the other techniques. One interesting addition though to in price analysis that's in part 13 but not in part 15 is the contracting officer's personal knowledge of the item being purchased can be a basis for fair and reasonable price. Really? So yeah, again, just like super simple. Um, so, and the documentation too, there's another part um, of the FAR that talks about the, do the documentation when you're putting your file together, doesn't need to be any more burdensome than, than necessary. So let's wrap it up. Let's wrap it up. Let's say, so Andre, hopefully this was helpful. We, we did a big kind of, you know, a journey on this. There, is, there are some real serious aspects to part 13, just to get serious for a second. You know, you still have to be cool, but you still have to be fair to companies. And you will, you can add, part 13 is not protest protected. So you, there's part 13 protests all the time. And if you're, if you, you can use a version of a trade-off in your solicitation, but you still have to evaluate according to what you say in your solicitation. You still have to be fair. If you're gonna say, we're gonna look at your technical price, we're gonna give some weaknesses and strengths, you gotta do that. And that's why so many part 13s turn into part 15 because f the guidance on how to do that is laid out very clearly in part 15. And so people are like, well, I, I don't know, I did a version of trade-off, how do I do this? They'll, they'll creep into part 15. So borrow principles from 15, but, but as efficient and non-burdensome as you make your part 13 requirement, you still have to do just enough documentation to make it fair and to uh, evaluate the proposals in the way that you say you're going to in the solicitation. But you got that covered and you can do amazing, very quick, very simple things um, because you have the discretion to do so as contracting officers. It's a very underutilized part of the, it's, it's utilized the principles of part 13 are underutilized. Yeah. So a uh, great question, Andre. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's it. That was a long great. one. Great, that was a very long one. Yeah, well. So if we do one of these on part 15, is it gonna be like a four hour? No, it's like just read 15. Series. Read part 15 tells you enough, just read it. Everyone already <laughs> knows 15 yeah. sounds like. Part so. 13 is because it's so misunderstood and underutilized. Takes a little bit. I mean, again, I think that you can watch this video, uh, or you could sit and just read part thirteen, or both. Yeah, and subscribe. Actually, you know what we should do? We should do the far audio book. Oh by yeah, Will Roberts. Yeah. Okay. Just, just, just read sit the far. in a nice, comfortable, and you can just read through the far, and we'll record it. Part two. <laughs> Policy it is important for it. Yeah. Yeah. Is that here? Let me try my voice. On this. Right. Okay. <clears throat> FAR Part 45, Government Property, 45.000 Scope. This part prescribes policies and procedures. Right. Is that relaxing? Yeah, it's relaxing. 
Ooh, something for put me to sleep. Well, maybe something for a long car ride. Yeah. Audio, audio, t- audio book. <laughs> That's a good way to end it. Just fade out on you. Fade out on, yeah. Reading the far. Okay. Part 13, Simplified Acquisition Procedures. This part prescribes policies and procedures for the acquisition of supplies and services, including construction, research and development, and commercial items.